Imagine, demand, and build a world transformed. Um, we're actually going to go in a minute straight into some breakout groups because um, we want to give everybody an opportunity to share their experience of their own areas with each other. Uh, because, of course, not all rural areas are the same. Um, Penny and I discovered when we were talking together that our rural areas are very different. Um, they're not all the same physically. Um, they don't have the same issues or face the same challenges. So, quite briefly, in our breakout groups, we're going to chat about the similarities and differences uh, between the areas you live in. Um, each group will have a facilitator to help the discussion. And we're going to give you five minutes. I know it's not long. Um, after which we'll come back together and share our key points. Uh, before we do, can I just remind everybody kindly um, to follow the TWT guidelines for discussion. So we're going to be respectful with each other and if we disagree, we're going to do it kindly and respectfully. Uh, we're going to be open to new ideas. Um, can we ask you to be really short in what you say if you can uh, about 30 seconds would be good so everybody has a chance to say something and um, we might have to limit you if, if you can't stop the flow and the other thing is um, step up and step back so if you feel that the discussion you can help the discussion to move on do step up um, but if you feel maybe you're saying a bit too much and other people aren't getting a word in edgeways then step back and finally, of course, bigotry will always be called out. So we're going to go into our breakout rooms for five minutes. Um, and hopefully our wonderful tech person today, Rory, <coughs> will have managed to sort all that out. And so as if by magic, we are all going to disappear into our breakout groups just to share a few experiences. Are we okay, Rory? Okay, so I know that was all very quick, but um, despite that, some interesting things came, certainly came up in um, our breakout room. So could we just have one person um, from each group who's going to feed back on any key points that, points that came out, please? So um, could we have the facilitator from room one? Um, room hi, one? yes. Uh, so that's me, Penny. Um, we, um, we talked a lot about public transport, the fact that um, if people in rural areas need services, if they're on universal credit or whatever it may be, they have a long way to travel. Um, and sometimes it's really difficult to travel and it's very expensive to travel by public transport. We talked about um, the lack of good jobs, accessibility of good jobs, um, and, and also education. Um, all, all very similar um, stories, really. And I just brought up that um, in Norfolk, we have additional problems of um, tourism and second homes, um, sort of which, which lay waste to um, certain communities in certain areas. Great, thank you very much, Jane. Um, who is a facilitator for group two, please? Um, I am, I'm Andrea. Okay, thank you. Hi, um, yeah, we, um, we had a really good discussion actually. Um, we had um, one person from Norfolk and another person from Tyndale and the person from um, Norfolk was running um, mental health services and supporting people with mental health issues and currently has a campaign going which is really, really good. And the person in Tyndale was um, discussing about um, you know, how they're self-sufficient and um, some of the services that they do have and the support groups that they have out there as well. So, it, yeah, it was really, really good to see um, what's going on in rural areas. You're on mute. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, I'm on mute. So that's great. Well, I think we'll pick up on the issue of mental health in rural areas later. So that's great. Um, could um, the facilitator for room three was me. So we had um, a, a range of experiences of rural areas. But one of the things, a number of things came up is a good question for us to try and answer is why are the Tories so strong in the rural areas? Um, 
there's a whole idea around land ownership and the capitalism started with the enclosures which was in the rural areas so that that was very interesting and then we're talking about the fact that young people leave rural areas demographic is skewed um, and about isolation so they're they're all key themes really um, so the facilitator for room four please that's me um, okay thank you Okay, so we actually only had two people in our group who live in rural areas and there was quite a lot of overlap. So some of the stuff that's already come up, but transport, um, transport links are often not being great. Access, little access to, to renting affordable housing. Um, one, of, one of the people in our group found that services available for people that she works with in rural settings were not nearly as good or more difficult to manage than in an urban setting. Um, yeah, I think more overlap than, than not overlap. Five, big one, group five. Hello, so I'm B, and I was facilitating in group five. So we also discussed that there's a lot of Tories rurally and interestingly, two of our group are currently overseas. So we had one member who's in Chile and he was discussing how independent landowners are now backing on to big forestry companies that have come in since the 1970s who are affecting their water rights for example and then somebody else who was in rural Portugal and she'd moved from Devon and had remarked upon how in Portugal it seems that a lot of the young people are fleeing to urban centres leaving behind the older generation and those that pass on then have empty properties so it seems like there's a good opportunity to do something with with uh, the available properties and then one one of our members who's in a village in Northumberland and said that despite the conservatives the MP who's there there's a lot of independent organizing happening independently of that so that's quite exciting to hear about thank you right. back to you Thank you very much, that's great. Um, we're actually going to have um, um, a couple of examples of things that are going on in rural Northumberland later, so that's, that's fantastic. Um, okay, so um, group six, please. Um, I'll, I'll say something. My name's Daniel and it took Hi. a, we were shameful because we all looked at each other for the, for the first three and a half minutes before realizing that we didn't mm -hmm. have a facilitator. Um, and, and therefore it's, and it's really sad because it means that three people didn't even get to say hello. So we'll re we're really sorry about that and we'll try and do better next time. Uh, okay, but did anybody say anything, Daniel? <laughs> did they have anything about anything? I think there were, echoes of things that have been reported by others and I, I don't see any immediate need to, to to add to what's been said by the other five groups okay okay well apologies uh, for the lack of facilitator a bit later that's great thank you and uh, group Yeah, hi, that was my group. Um, and uh, the people that shared um, in our group uh, had moved away from rural areas. Um, I think we spoke a little bit about kind of uh, social conservative attitudes and how that can be, you know, make rural areas quite difficult to grow up in. Um, and also um, uh, Poppy in the group was uh, speaking about kind of the need for um, left-wing political movements um, in rural areas um, around things like um, flooding. Uh, so the flooding in, in the Calder Valley, um, you know, it's really necessary that kind of, yeah, people put pressure on um, on government there. Um, but yeah, I think there are a few difficulties with people sharing, um, uh, using tech in, in my group. We didn't, we didn't get that much. Right, that's that's really interesting. Thank you, because I think that, that what that that demonstrates is that link between a local issue and actually the broader political spectrum, which sometimes gets lost, I think, um, in the rural areas. Okay, that's really great. There was lots of interesting points there, um, and I would like now to introduce our um, first speaker, who is Dr. Francis Rowe, um, who, as I 
I've already said um, works for the Centre for Rural Economy, but it's speaking independently. So over to Francis. Okay, um, I'm Fran Penny. That's more informal. Thanks. Uh, I'm just going to make a, a few kind of reflective comments, really, and they're not particularly political, but they're more born out of my experience of working in rural development for many, many years now, um, not always in academia, that's quite recent, but uh, for um, the local regional development agency, uh, I was chair of Northumberland National Park for five years. Um, I've got a background in agriculture, but I've been interested in the countryside for as long as I can remember really. And I've been with CRE for about the last three and a half years. Um, and we're working on some really interesting projects with policymakers, including uh, the new policy that's coming out of DEFRA to pay land managers to produce what's called public goods. So everything from clean air to looking after wildlife um, and paying by results, which is a bit of a challenge and a challenging idea. And also projects um, looking at the future of rural communities. So this gathering is quite apposite, really. Um, I think my first kind of reflection is that many of the issues and challenges facing rural areas have, have been with us for a long time. So lots of those have been listed already, unaffordable housing, declining services, um, decaying town centres, um, the flight of young people and an ageing demographic, and the environmental impacts of farming and the loss of biodiversity and the climate crisis, you know, which haven't really been in the news very much lately, uh, are, are, are with us and have been with us for a while. And I think that the pandemic has, has brought this into sharp relief. And it's interesting, and this is anecdotal, so it's not um, kind of evidence-based reflection, but the demand for housing in rural areas from Northumberland to Wales to the Highlands of Scotland uh, seems to be um, you know, going through the roof as people are sort of fleeing urban areas and thinking that moving to the countryside will, will, will uh, increase their chances of avoiding the pandemic and, and provide for a, a better quality of life uh, and in a sense there's nothing new about that either because people have been doing that since the 1970s leaving cities to move to the countryside but of course it has an effect because with limited supply of housing and uh, quite a tight planning system of course that results in uh, housing unaffordability uh, which is a problem that doesn't really sort of go away so uh, but I also think that the pandemic uh, is perhaps going to bring changing patterns of consumption, um, how we learn, how we access education, how we access services. So it's kind of all up for grabs really. Um, and I think change is with us uh, and it's how we respond and what we do about it, which I think is, is sort of the, the critical thing. I think it's probably worth reflecting on the fact that most people actually live in cities and uh, they have their fair share of problems too. Uh, and there's a kind of complex relationship between cities and the countryside and uh, people in cities and, and some of us have lived in cities and work in cities, you know, have this deep attachment to the countryside and also rely on it for things that we need, not just food and energy and water, but also uh, for our health and well-being too. So there's this kind of interplay between the countryside and cities really. Um, and in terms of what the economy does, then rural areas look quite similar on the face of it to, to urban areas. There's, uh, there's not that many people employed in farming, although farming takes up a lot of the land area. Um, but actually, you know, sort of businesses are, are pretty much doing similar things to, to those in cities. But the policy doesn't always work for rural areas. And I think that's one of the challenges. Um, you know, conceived with an urban mindset. So policy isn't necessarily that finely kind of tuned to what rural areas need. So I think I'm a kind of fan of bottom up action, but also top down policy change. And I think we need both. It's not an either or. And there's a kind of interdependency between the urban and the rural, which I think is a strength rather than seeing it as a problem. Um, so I don't think I'm, I'm into rural isolationism. I think it's more about how can we kind of harness networks and resources and and good ideas uh, to to bring about the, the changes that we want and uh, you know there's there's lots of great examples out there of how local communities have done some really smart things um, you know through owning land in in scotland through community land buyouts uh, 
land trusts being able to build affordable housing, um, community energy projects, community broadband projects. So there's lots going on, but those projects need to have a connection with the outside world, if you like. Uh, they're not self-contained. Um, so there's, there's a need to kind of build on people's networks for ideas, for resources and uh, for energy and for people to do things as well. So I think one of the really big issues and problems that's kind of been touched upon um, is, is land ownership um, and property ownership, you know, because if you can't influence what happens to land and you can't influence what happens to empty shops and empty premises in rural areas, um, you know, how can we um, sort of make progress to the kind of future we might want? Uh, and we also need investment in critical services. And I guess broadband is, the, you know, digital connectivity is the big one. Um, and that's going to be the, the route to, to rural areas, not only uh, being able to, um, for businesses, but also for communities to be able to, to do things differently um, and to be connected to ideas, resources and so forth. Uh, and I think just sort of finally, uh, we need some kind of new models and approaches and there's, there's lots to learn from uh, nationally and internationally as well. And, and some of those new approaches might include how we work and who we work with. So not just uh, doing things differently, but perhaps, you know, supping with the devil and uh, building sort of relationships with, with people who, uh, who might be able to provide resources and might even be persuaded um, that there's a better way of doing things. So maybe not all landowners um, are going to be a, a challenge and a, and a problem. Um, and I think finally, because rural areas are all different, there's lots of different ways of doing things and there's no, there's no silver bullet. Uh, and I think, how do we collect up our experience? How do we learn from each other? And then how do we use that to influence policy going forward? So that's just kind of some reflections from me. Okay. That's, thank you. Thanks so much, Francis. So I, I think you've touched on a, a lot of things that um, people might like want to follow up. So you have, if you have a question for your name in the chat, and, and uh, we'll, t we'll have about 10 minutes uh, for questions to, to Francis. If, um, if you're asking your question, could you be as succinct as possible? Because we're short of time, um, as always in these things, um, seconds if possible. So, um, have we got anybody who would like to ask a question? Yeah, I have a question. Um, hey. So, because Fran said she worked in agriculture, so I was wondering if she could expand on that a bit and talk about if she knows of any like ways that communities are democratizing food production in rural areas um, or anything to do with that sort of stuff. Yeah, I mean, there are lots, there are lots of small scale projects, you know, from things like community supported agriculture, which is a, a model that started in, in America, uh, where people have a sh almost have a share um, in an area of land and a say over what gets produced uh, and also a, a share of the harvest. And uh, that, that's, uh, there's not that many examples in the north of England, but there are um, in the West Country and in, and in the South. Um, the challenge with agriculture is, is how to do things that break away from the kind of global model, uh, which is big agriculture and supplying big retailers, um, which is mostly how we access our food and, and how to do it um, in a way that actually um, is sustainable, not just environmentally sustainable, but is sustainable in terms of uh, people's involvement uh, and uh, from a kind of economic point of view. Um, edible Tod Todmorden is another example in um, in Yorkshire where they've done this, um, and that's and it didn't it didn't happen overnight. Um, it was very much um, key people who drove the change forward um, and have been sticking at it uh, for at least a decade plus uh, to make to make the change. Um, but they're very um, they're very open to people learning from their example to see if they can use some of the ideas. Um, I think it's called Edible, Edible Todmorden, I believe is the name of it. So there are lots of models around. 
uh, but when you add them all up in terms of, of the overall food supply, there's still really a very small percentage. That doesn't mean they're not worth doing, uh, but it, it is actually quite difficult to get these things working at scale. And maybe um, it's about concentrating on the very local and trying to make a difference at the very local level because scaling up becomes quite of a challenge uh, to make these work at scale. Uh, and that, that's, that, is, that is more difficult. Does that help? Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Great, great question. Thank you, Francis. Great answer. Um, I see Sarah's posted in the chat about um, flat pack democracy. Did you want to ask about that, um, Sarah, or say something? Sarah Lazenby? Oh, you're, you're not coming through clearly, Sarah. Sorry. That's not, it's, uh, it's not working for us. I can't, we can't hear you properly. Um, has anybody else got a, a further question for Francis? Can I, oh, is that a hand? Craig? Hi, Fran. Could you tell us, tell us something more about um, this movement from the city to rural areas in terms of housing and that kind of thing? Yeah. Uh, well, it, it's got a fancy name. It's called counter urbanization. Um, that's what the geographers call it. But it's been a trend uh, for since about the end of the 1970s. Um, and and it's, it sort of manifests itself either in uh, people with young families moving from cities to the countryside uh, to, 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 you know, for a better quality of life in sort of maybe their thirties or forties. Um, and also pre-retirement is, is a kind of another peak where, where people think about retiring to the countryside. And often what happens, and this is a bit counterintuitive, is that those people particularly move to the countryside and often start up a business um, actually before they reach retirement age. So many of the sort of rural entrepreneurs who start up businesses um, are people who moved from cities um, or have taken early retirement or can afford to move to the countryside but they they don't just sort of decide to do nothing um, they they actually either bring their businesses with them or they start a new one and there's quite a lot of evidence that this kind of group of people um, are quite valuable in in rural areas they might add to the housing challenge but actually, um, they also bring their ideas and energy and investment um, in terms of starting up small businesses, um, as well as people who maybe have been um, born and bred in a place um, and, and are running businesses as well. So uh, it's quite an interesting area of, of, of kind of study. And the research centre that I'm involved with is actually um, setting up a new, um, a new venture to uh, work with some of these businesses and to try and find... Um, try and help them to um, to be more productive, more successful, employ more people, um, do new and interesting things um, in rural areas to create some kind of sustainable economy. Uh, that's not to say that that small businesses aren't necessarily um, successful, but they can struggle um, because they're, they're they're separate. separate you know, they're not. Um, necessarily that well connected to markets and they're not that well connected to the services that government offer to support to support them to to grow and develop and uh, and you know and bring their new ideas you know to market uh, very often um you know, the, the the policy perception is that uh, anything interesting in the economy is happening in cities and, and businesses in rural areas aren't doing anything worthwhile and which is simply not the case but often they're outside the, the policy ambit. So one of the one of the aims of this new centre um, is to try and influence the policymakers by actually changing, or what's known as rural proofing, the way in which uh, government support for business works in rural areas. Great, great question. Great answer again, Fran. Thank you very much. Has anybody <laughs> else got a question? Okay, um, I'm just thinking about um, where I live and it will apply everywhere but there's, there's additional complications here that maybe don't apply in other areas. Um, so there's, there's kind of various 
different communities and um, I would say that there's the the community of people who are very attached to the land the farming community there's and in this area there's quite um it's kind of quite post-industrial as quite a few rural areas are that, that used mm. to have sort of you know in this area it's, it's mining was the the thing that um that went um but you know families that have been long time in the area um but aren't connected to the land um and then there's the people who come in from outside and sometimes their their interests seem to clash and mm. there's there's a sort of it's not almost sometimes it's not interest it's just a social class and one of the things that we have to deal with here is the the sort of um different attitudes to the welsh language as well which creates mm. further barriers between communities um and um i was also thinking that actually it's the farming communities that dominate the county council um you know in terms of councillors um and i just wondered about how experiences of, of bringing different groups of people together um based on where they live rather than their differences yeah uh, i mean that all that all does sound very familiar from you know lots of experience um around the country and you know how do you actually um have local development that involves more than um the powerful um and and it's it's a key issue um and particularly um the powerful who 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 run local government um because not everybody uh has that route available to them to influence things so there's actually uh there's no easy answer to this but there are models of good practice and things that work associated with um, a long-standing program in the EU, um, which we're kind of at the tail end of, I guess, for the UK, called the LEADER program, um, which deliberately, uh, you know, tried to encourage bottom-up development, but, but the model um, was, was to uh, try and get different interest groups represented uh to be able to work together around a common plan for development uh, and some of those groups have made very strenuous and imaginative efforts to involve the more marginalized groups who don't get a say uh, and and you know young people can fall into to that category for example um, as well as you know um, the sorts of groups that you've identified in in your community so there isn't an easy answer to this and uh, that, that, that issue of sort of who dominates the councils um, and the land based interests and the fact that that doesn't feel like everybody uh, is one I think we'd recognise here in, in Tyndale as well um, and certainly in Northumberland uh, you know, to, to a certain extent. So, so there is kind of good practice around to look at and it, but it's also about how, how can you do this in a, in a different way that tries to, to bring some of those marginalised voices together. So, so things like people's assemblies or giving people um, some, you know, thinking about how people might feed in their ideas without having to come to meetings and be intimidated. Uh, you know, sort of ways of using technology to be able to provide people with a voice. There's also a network uh, coordinated by Action for Communities in Rural England with the acronym ACRE and they've done a lot of work on this as well. Uh, so it is kind of worth following up to, to see what works and, and how to, to try and bring these different communities of interest together because the idea that there's one kind of um, homogenous rural community and everybody is pulling together is a, is a little bit rose tinted I think as you've identified. Somebody else, Sarah, had a, a, another question or a point in the chat but I'm, I'm afraid we need to move on because we're on a very tight schedule but we can come back to that at the end. We've got more time at the end for questions. So I'm going to hand over to Penny now. Great, thanks very much, Jane. And thank you for all those questions, they were great. So um, I'm now going to ask Jane from Norfolk Transformed um, about community organising that has happened in rural Norfolk. Okay, great, thank you, Penny. Um, I'm just going to say, given that I've, I've noticed a few comments in the chat about people wanting to be prepared, 
in a bit, we're going to go into breakout groups again and talk about specific things. And one of the things that we're going to be talking about is community organising in rural areas, because it's something that I think needs to be talked about and thought about a lot. So just to give some examples of um, some really good community organising that I know has gone on in Norfolk, um, certainly um, there's a very effective mental health campaign. Um, there's a, a campaign for uh, better provision for mental health across Norfolk and Suffolk, but in particular in North Norfolk, and I think this is what um, was probably spoken about in Andrea's breakout group earlier on, there's been a very specific campaign um, due to the number, the very high number of young male suicides in a particular, it's quite a small area, and, um, and the problems with um, the young people being able to um, get any mental health care there. I mean, there basically is none. So the campaign is to get a walk-in emergency um, mental health care centre in that area. Um, and I, I, I won't talk about that at length, but um, I think that's been a really, really good campaign for people to get involved in. It comes from the community and it has ramifications across a lot of areas um, of organising. Other, other campaigns that I know have been very successful um, and certainly involve lots of members of the community have been, there's a, a campaign called North and Nor, which is about um, railway transport in Norfolk and East Anglia. And at the bottom line, um, it's a campaign to, um, to nationalise, renationalise the railways, but it's a, an excellent way of getting the whole community involved. So there are lots of local transport groups involved in that campaign, all working together um, to, to make an impact on how um, the transport could be improved in the area. And another very successful one, uh, well actually it wasn't successful in a sense, but it was successful in that it brought the community together, um, was the Save Our Children's Centres campaign, which um, happened across Norfolk uh, because the, the, the Conservative Council were uh, basically closed all the children's centres. And that's something that involved the communities both in the towns and in rural areas. And finally, um, there's an ongoing campaign um, to fight the Conservative Council's cuts to provision for children with um, special and additional needs, um, which um, has got a lot of people involved. So that's the kind of things that I know that people are organising around in Norfolk, Penny. Thank you very much, Jane. So I don't know, have we lost Jane? Jane was going to ask me a question. Sorry, Hello? I was going to ask you a question. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I, my finger's very triggered. That's okay, that's okay. <laughs> um, so I'd like to know um, your experiences of actually campaigning politically in rural areas what were the challenges and, and what policies, you know, might help to campaign for the left in, in rural areas, do you think? Right, that's a great question. Last election, I was the parliamentary candidate for Hexham constituency, which is a Tory constituency, and I'm afraid that we lost. But it's also 600 square miles and there are 61,000 voters. So it's hugely rural and um, not very densely populated. And it's positively feudal in lots of ways. We have big landowners and the olden days when the landlord told their serfs how to, how to vote has sort of endured slightly. Um, the issues that came up in the breakout rooms exactly reflect the problems that we have here about distance and about resources and about access and about young people and about there's a big mess going on about education at the moment here we have a mixed system of three tier and two tier so people are being left traveling huge distances um, and I think that one of the things that we've got to do in order to, to get people to understand is to mobilize small groups. And there are correspondingly huge numbers of groups of people who are actively working in their community, but they don't see it as being a political act, what they're doing, and it doesn't translate. Into, and I think we've got a huge political education um, 
challenge in 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 this rural area anyway where people understand get people to understand the relationship between their vote and their actions and what happens in their community and we have to do it through community listening to what people's concerns are so we don't have top down anymore um and we've got the local elections come in may and we're trying to get as many people to get involved in local politics to change the complexion of local politics which is hugely tory so it's a massive job to do um and that was quite clear at the last election so i'd be on the doorstep saying do you know if you vote tory they will sell off the nhs and people would say oh no that we don't want that we on it the nhs needs to be publicly owned and then they vote tory so there's a disjuncture between what people think and what people do and people's experience yeah okay thank you um okay so sorry jane no i was just going to say that all sounds very familiar to me sorry carry on no that's okay um so i'd just like to uh, introduce two two speakers that we've got I want to introduce Alison Atkinson, um, who is a coordinator for a broadband project in the Allen Valleys. Are you there, Alison? I am. Now Craig has unmuted me. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? The trouble with the rural areas is that the broad, the connection, <laughs> is Alison there? Yes, yes. that came about yes. and how's it, how's it going? Thank you. Okay, so I work in a, a small, with a small team who are um, trying to put in broadband into the Allen Valleys. So to, it started about 2016 when a couple of team who live out in the countryside outside the village of Allendale just got fed up with the internet service they had. I mean, it, it, you're talking two or three meg. Um, out to if you actually have a broadband link when you're outside the village. So they looked at the best options and in the end we they selected um, a not-for-profit community benefit society called uh, Broadband for the Rural North who are based uh, in Lancashire. And their idea is that it's the community that installs the broadband network. So since then we have been working hard to install a network here. So we've got 90 miles of core ducting we need to put in to, to do the core part of the network and an additional 90 miles of ducting from the core into individual homes. And the idea is that at the end, every home, which is 1600 properties here in the Allen Valleys, will have one gigabyte of fiber into their home and that will cost them 30 pounds a month. So that was the challenge. Uh, we spent about uh, a year, just over a year, talking to all the landowners. So we don't go on the roads because that costs lots of money. We have to, or what we're trying to do is lay ducting across, across the land, which means talking to all the landowners and getting permission to cross their land. In the main, that's been okay. But, and the landowners um, themselves, even the big estates have been very supportive, but particularly on the big estates, once you start talking to the agents, everything slows down dramatically because they have to do due diligence or whatever they have to do, it slows the project up enormously. So uh, we've installed ducting, uh, we've blown fiber, we're learning lots of new skills so we can now uh, splice fiber, we can install it into the home, we can put boxes on the walls, we can do all sorts of stuff. Um, and we went live with our first 24 properties started going live in July. But as we've got 1600 to do, um, it's quite a lot more to do yet. We've still got more ducting to lay. Um, so we're progressing. The main challenges of the project have been volunteers because it's a community event uh, project. We need to get volunteers to help us all the way along and learning these skills with us. To start with, there was a lot of enthusiasm, etc. But that was in 2017. We are now in 2020. So these things take a long time. And I th the volunteers have obviously, some of them got fed up um, and drifted. So it's, it's trying to keep that momentum. So volunteering and getting enough volunteers to help us is key because the core team, as we call ourselves, seven of us, 
we all have day jobs you know so time is a problem too we don't have all the time every day to work on this project uh, as i mentioned the agents for the landowners they were a big challenge for us too still one is causing us issues um, communicating what we're doing as well to the Allen Valleys is being tough. We feel we're doing it okay and then you get people on our Allen Valleys face group, uh, we have an Allen Valleys page as most areas do these days, will come up and say what's going on, you haven't told us anything and we think we've been quite communicative but you know obviously you can communicate more, communicate more. and it's, it's the time as well, you know it's just a long time to get this project going but it is positive to know that we have put people live and we are continuing to put people live and it is possible but it we just need time and more volunteers to help us that's it in a nutshell thank you hi i'm craig i wanted to talk to you very quickly about um, a project called higher ground in Allendale. it's a social enterprise that seeks to improve mental health and well-being through gardening our goal is to increase well-being and tackle social isolation by promoting meaningful activity, peer support and exercise in a safe and a positive environment. We promote sustainability through cultivating and supplying locally grown organic pr produce. We have a vegetable box scheme. Here's an example of a veg box. <laughs> Um, and our workshops <laughs> help people learn new skills. We're based at the, for, at the former Allendale First School, surrounded by the stunning Northumbrian landscape. The garden and the polytunnels and the pond area are on the old school field, and we've converted a drab old temporary classroom into a comfortable space with open plan areas for group activities, niches for private conversations, and a comfy zone to chill out when it's raining. We also offer a small library, a kitchen facilities, and a warm welcome. On Thursdays between 10 and 12, we have a coffee den, a drop-in um, for coffee and a chat when it's open to everyone. We have volunteer days when local people can come and help us maintain the garden and the buildings. And from a, a mental health point of view, um, to join the project, um, our clients need to have spoken to a healthcare professional about their mental health uh, and they may be referred or signposted to us. Um, we offer three hour sessions with a qualified hortic horticulturist. Um, we've got careers counsellors and each registered individual will have the opportunity to complete a personal development goals and build confidence and self-esteem through internal workshops. Our challenges were in the early days uh, dealing with the local authority about leasing the old school field and buildings was, was a nightmare. And our ongoing challenges are to do with uh, funding, uh, bidding for grants and that kind of thing. Thank you. That's great. Thanks very much, Craig. I'm sorry I was muted, so I didn't get to... Um in, introduced to you but that, that that was Craig talking about higher ground which is in Allendale which is in the Hexham constituency okay so over to Jane now if Jane is there for the um we're going to go into um yeah I'm breakout here room soon but we seem to have lost Jane ah hi yeah, Jane hi um okay everybody so now we're going to do the kind of hard thinking bit and uh, what we want to do is to start thinking about the future in the most creative ways we can. We've been given some fantastic examples of things that have happened, things people have done. Um, and I think what we're hoping to do now is to start building on that, to think about ways that um, we can uh, make life in rural areas better. I think Penny actually put her, her, her finger on it when she said that, you know, there's a lot going on in rural areas. A, a lot of stuff happens, people get together to make things happen. But uh, I think the issue is, you know, how do we, how do we turn that into um, politics, basically? And, um, you know, TWT and the world, the transform groups locally are all about political education. So I think we want to be thinking about, you know, how can we use political education creatively in rural areas um, to try and change things, basically. So we're going to focus on three things. 
if you were in group one or group two uh, in the earlier session, we're going to be talking about community organising in rural areas. So how can we as activists um, engage with local people and help them feel empowered to make changes for themselves and help them to think about the sort of changes that they would like to make. Um, if you were in group three or four or five, we're going to be talking about setting up rural transformed groups. How would that work? It, how is it more difficult uh, to set up a, a rural transformed group than an urban transformed group? And what could a, um, a rural transformed group do? How could we spread political education through that, but in a way that would be accessible to people? And if you were in group six or seven uh, before, that's the groups that are going to do a bit of utopian thinking. So when we've, when we've succeeded with all of this, what will our rural life look like? Because um, we need to know what we're aiming for if we're going to be planning to make those changes. So um, we will have 15 minutes in those groups to get down as many ideas as possible. Um, your facilitators should have, <laughs> if, if the technology has worked, um, have, have access to a, a slide show. And what we're hoping is that each group can um, uh, type their ideas onto their slide and then when we go through at the end it'll be easier for us to see uh, the key points. Um, obviously when we feed back we haven't got time for too much discussion so if you could keep it to your, your key points that you want to, to bring across that would be absolutely great. So I think now it's time um, Rory if you're and um, sorry I should have said um, for Francis' benefit because um, She's going to try and do that for her group. Um, you just have to screen share the um, slides if you can, Francis, but don't worry about it if you can't, just, just the group can just make notes. Right, so Rory, I think we're ready to go into our breakout groups. Thank you. Um, we're, we're very short of time, so I'm basically going to share my screen and um, go through these slides at a very fast pace, if that's all right. Um, and hopefully we'll have time for one or two more questions at the end. Can everybody see that? Hello, can we have some thumbs up if you can see the, my screen? Can you see the slides? Excellent, thank you. Right, so in our group, um, we talked about um, how effective it was for local political activists to get known through cross-party projects and community projects but how hard it was to get cohesion because of low population density. Um, so getting people together is hard. Um, and um, um, uh, somebody commented on get it, how getting a campaign bus in Allendale really helped to move people around. Um, and we talked about the difficulty of um, transferring community action to political thinking. So um, uh, one of our teams, Steve, I think it was mentioned um, that they ran a food bank, but they kept the, Le the Labour Party low profile because people would be put off if, if they knew it was a Labour Party involvement. Um, so, um, and somebody else um, made the point that uh, communities far away from Westminster can often just feel that much more distance from politics. So don't think politics is really anything to do with them. So that's, that's quite a lot of stuff that we, we felt we had to overcome. So um, I'm going to leave it there. Um, second group, was it Andrea? Could you take us quickly through your slides? Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, I was supposed to say stay on there. So um, we basically, we just we were talking quite a lot around the fact that in some of the areas that we are in, there are issues with uh, being linked with a political party per se. So trying to make that more about communities coming together, regardless of party politics. Um, is, is significant, so focusing on that community aspect rather than anything else. Um, uh, but there's a common goal and a purpose we're working towards, so uh, Bev was talking a lot about the mental health project we've been working on, so everybody's working towards that thing. Um, lobbying your MP or your councillor, um, targeting stakeholders, including unions. I added that in the end because we're having a brief conversation about unions right towards the end of that. Um, I, I added social media. I didn't necessarily raise that in the meeting, but 
that's been really significant some of the work that I've done um which I mean so some of the community projects I've been involved with um things like creating templates for people that yeah could potentially go on your social media so writing the letter already for people to sign or send off or adapt as they see fit um showcasing what you're doing with pop-up like pop-up things in, in the in the in the space that you're in as well to raise awareness about the things that you're, you're engaged with um leafleting a toolkit to support which kind of taps into the, the templates for letters and things as well and then raising awareness of, of unions and how people can unionize Fantastic, brilliant ideas. Thank you very much, Andrea. Um, so I don't know who group three was, but have you taken notes? I know the groups got had to be changed around because we have different people. Shall we move on to the next group then? Um, we can come back to that. If, um, if... Hi, Jen. Hello. It was my group, but my connection was so bad that I couldn't, uh, I had to scream, but I can just quickly say, and I'll put the slide up later. Yes, please. Um, was that we had a big conversation about political education and that how it is and how, how you go about it in some shape or form using the experience of people people's lives. So somebody suggested looking at a minor's legacy and how there was self-help then what sort of self-help can we develop now but a big issue is doing political education outside the tea. excellent brilliant thank you penny um next group who, who was grouped for that's me hi hi holly could you take us through those yeah yeah i took some notes we had a really good discussion um i think maybe two main things that that we concluded was that maybe rather than focusing too much on the fact that people are, are voting Tories and to get them to stop voting Tories would be to focus on local problems and organise politically around those problems without linking them to a party. Um, and then we also talked about how we sort of tap into local networks, so local newsletters, church communities, women's institutes, agricultural shows, maybe setting up a stall at those places, making ourselves known within networks that already exist. Um, yeah, those are the two main things that we that we concluded. Brilliant. Thank you very, very much. You're all being excellent at going through these really quickly. Thank you so much. Uh, group five. So much like others, we discussed that one of the main points is overcoming political suspicion and this mindset of what's in it for us. Mm -hmm. So if you are thinking about setting up these groups, you can't simply be a Labour Party extension. You need to really market yourself as much broader than that, echoing what others have said. Um, some of our group felt that there was less energy for change in certain rural communities and a certain fatalism around, oh, we've always done it this way. But actually, we felt also within our group that there is a great possibility for radicalism, particularly around environmental projects. So John, who's part of Tynesdale uh, Transformed, was talking about how in working with individual farmers, for example, they may have their own activities going on with different organisations, including RSPB. So it's definitely worth working with groups that are already established in order to overcome obstacles and Maddie and our group mentioned that it's important to stop using language around fighting against capitalism or patriarchy because that really might turn off people who don't share those views and instead what we can do is frame project projects as common goods or universal goods because that's definitely going to bring people around much faster so thank you from our group Brilliant, absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, group six. Who was group six? Should we come back to group six? Let's let's go on to group seven because we are very short of time. Group seven. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, our group. Um, we were talking a lot about food um, and thinking about uh, democratizing uh, kind of food production um, and getting kind of farming as part of the Green New Deal. Um, so we talked about um, yeah having control over over food production within the community. Um, lots of people wanted to see kind of more connection between cities and country aside. Um, so the kind of vibrant culture of urban areas in rural areas um, and fast green transport would help do that as well as broadband of course. 
Um, and we talked about rewilding as well um, to increase biodiversity. Um, Fran was saying that it, it needs scientific knowledge and expertise, so this could create high school jobs in these rural areas as well. So that'd be really good. Brilliant, fantastic. Thank you very much, um, Group 7. Anybody from Group 6 want to share what their discussions were? I think maybe Group 6 was collapsed into Group 7. Ah, oh, right. Excellent. So that's, that's the end of the screen share. Over to you, Penny. Hi, that's great. Um, we'll make sure that everybody gets a copy of all those those slides. So I'll hurry up. And... Um, we've just got a couple of minutes for questions. We have to be finished at half past. So if you've got a question for any of the speakers or a point that can you either put your hand up using the reactions or post in the chat, uh, that would be great. Has anybody got any? Any questions or points they'd like to make? Um, yes. Is that um, can I? I just like to raise something that's come up in the in the two thousand and seventeen Labour manifesto. They talked a lot about rural proofing all policy. And in fact, um, Fran mentioned it as well. Unfortunately, it seemed to disappear out of the 2019. But I think that we can we should explore that really so that all policy has to work in rural areas would be a start and it would raise all sorts of questions um, about uh, distribution of resources uh, and an understanding of the needs. So Mary's posted in the chat about citizens assemblies. Yeah. Mary, do you want to say something? Uh, just to say that um, I'm in rural Argyll in Scotland and our little local group is hoping to organise um, uh, for Argyll and Butte uh, Citizens Assembly to look at specifically these issues which um, you know, clearly are political, as has been said, but not in a party, party political way, with access to good information. Uh, clearly, funding is going to be the problem, um, and, uh, but I, I don't see that it, it won't work. I think it's something that ought to be um, talked about more because it's about active citizenship, it's about engaging everyone in a discussion of what what they would want to see or what they don't do and don't like, uh, what their aspirations are. I think that's really a, a vital mechanism that we should be using. Okay. That's great. Yes, thank you, Mary, because that's about democracy, isn't it? And community organizing is about giving people a voice. I, I think that's, that's really important. Um, is there anybody else, somebody's raised in the chat? Anybody got experience of rural book clubs? Um, I think we're going to start a political reading group here. We'll let you know how that goes. So Jane, do you think it's time to wrap up? I think it might be, and we've got three minutes left. Can I just ask a very quick question, mm -hmm. you cheeky from Fran? Um, I see that there's quite, oh, sorry, I've just asked, can I? Is that all right, Penny? <laughs> um, I, I see that there's a lot of stuff um, in the news at the moment about people, as you say, moving from the cities to the, the, the more rural areas, but as a consequence of discovering that they can work from home rather than setting up a business in the rural areas. And my concern is that that could lead to um, an even worse increase in house prices in places like Norfolk, where we've got a huge disparate, you know, the difference between the very rich and the very poor. And I can see that being more of a problem. Can you, do you think it would be more of a problem or less of a problem? Um, I think in the short term, it could well be more of a problem because you're going to have people, <coughs> oh, excuse me, with the um, purchasing power to buy houses at prices <coughs> that local people can't afford um, in yeah. some instances. Um, and really, um, this is where you can't avoid <coughs> your response being a political one because we need more affordable housing if we've needed it for ages. Uh, and um, the planning system, which is um, about to be thrown out the window by the current government, um, 
in in favor of a kind of um you know free for all um you know is is that going to necessarily bring uh, more homes to the countryside at more affordable prices not necessarily um and it could come at great environmental cost so uh, we we actually need to have um, a planning system that can deliver more affordable homes, which means going back to um, requiring developers to uh, to invest in affordable homes as as condition of their planning permission, rather than being able to build anywhere, um, you know, uh, on greenfield sites simply for profit. So we need a political response to this because I don't see how else um, we're, we're going to we're going to manage, um, and we need to be able to put to use the empty properties that exist in rural towns for the purposes of housing, um, you know, flats and starter homes for people trying to get on the first rung of the housing ladder or just to rent somewhere to live. Because what we don't want is a situation um, where uh, lots of people come into rural areas. Yes, you know, they're, they're, they're in work, they might be bringing other assets and benefits with them, but a situation where um, a lot of people then have to move out because they can't afford to live there anymore. So, uh, you know, we, we need we need some more affordable housing and we need it quick. Um, right. I, I think the other thing I would say is that if, if there is a large influx of people moving into rural areas because they can move from home, it's also an opportunity to to harness those people's effort and energy to do things if, if at all possible. But I think the house price thing is going to be a problem. Yeah, thank you. That's great. You've done so much work this afternoon. It's uh, fantastic. So we've got lots of ideas and uh, thank you all for coming. A really exciting session. And thank you very much um, to the speakers. Um, uh, we're going to make sure that uh, we get copies, as I said, of the Billy, but also uh, Andy has suggested that we set up a WhatsApp group. Um, and if you want to join it, that's great. Um, I think Rory will have that in hand and somehow we'll manage it, but it would be great resource to have people carry on talking. So um, just before we go, um, I'd like to hand you over to Jane, but thank you so much. Um, and um, yes, onwards and upwards. Hi everybody, um, just to say that um, if you are interested in setting up a rural transformed group, um, I think the thing that you could do is to um, uh, email, I'm just trying to find the, um, the right thing to copy for you, um, I'm going to put it in the chat, Rory, who has been our fantastic um, comms person, and you know, tech person today. Um, hi, Rory. Thank you so much um, for coping with everything that was thrown at you. I'm going to put your. Um, actually, could you put your e your um, email address in the chat? And if people are interested in setting up their own rural transform group, they can email Rory, and and he'll post signpost you where to go. But thank you so much again. As Penny said, it's been absolutely great hearing all your ideas and so on. And hopefully we can bring transformation to the rural areas. Thank you very much indeed. Bye everybody. View the full TWT20 programme and become a supporter today to help us deliver political education all year round at theworldtransformed.org.